Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters, and again I hear these squashes rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms green to the very door, and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees, with some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave, where by his fire the hermit sits alone. These beauteous forms, to a long absence, have not been to me, as is a landscape to a blind man's eye, but oft in lonely rooms, and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owned them, in hours of weariness, sensation sweet, felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration, feelings too of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love, no less I trust to them I may have owed another gift or aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the affection gently lead us on, until the breath of this corporeal frame, and even the motion of our human blood, almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body, and become a living soul, while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. If this be but a vain belief, yet oh how oft, in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir, unprofitable, and the fever of the world have hung upon the beating of my heart, how oft in spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvian, why, thou wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee. And now, with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognition dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again, while here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts, that in this moment there is life and food for future years, and so I dare to hope, though changed, no doubt, from what I was when first I came among these hills, when like a row I bounded over the mountain by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature, then, the course of pleasure of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by, to me was all in all. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion, 
the tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood. Their colours and their forms were often to me an appetite of feeling and love. They had no need of remoter charm, by thought supply, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past, and all its aching joy are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint I, nor mourn nor murmur, other gifts have followed. For such loss I would believe abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless use, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity. No harsh nor granting thoughts of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore I am still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold. From this green earth, of all the mighty world, of eye and ear, both what they have create and what perceive will please to recognize in nature and language of the sense the anchor of the purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart, the soul of all my moral being. Nor perchance, if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay, for thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river. Thou, my dearest friend, my dear, dear friend, and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart, and read my former pleasure in the shooting light of thy wild eyes. Oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I once was, my dear, dear sister. And this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her, this her privilege, to all the years of this our life, to lead from joy to joy, for she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts, that neither evil tongues, rash judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men, nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall ever prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings. Therefore, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk, and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee, and in after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, thy memory be a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies. Oh, then if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me? And these my exhortations, nor perchance, if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together, and that I, so long a worshipper of nature, hither came, unwearied in that service, rather say, with warmer love, oh, with far deeper seal of holier love, nor wilt thou then forget 
that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake.